Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Spring is here and the hot days of summer won't be far behind. So it's time to start thinking about lawn care. And yes, it's time to set out your tomatoes. So Tom Mashur is out in the garden to get us started with our warm season vegetables. And for folks who don't have a lot of space for a traditional garden, we'll give you some ideas about planting in containers. All of that and more is coming up next on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. So stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Booker T. Lee. Glad to be here. Booker is an extension agent right here in Shelby County, and Tanya Ashworth is here. Thanks for having me. Tanya is an extension agent in Fayette County. Thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Fun, yeah. always fun. <laughs> All right. Well, Booker, everybody wants a beautiful green line, okay? So what do we need to do to get that beautiful green line? First question, though. Should we fertilize our lines now? If so, then what do we use? Chris, right now, the Bermuda grass begin to come out of dormancy now. You see a lot of lawn that begin to turn green. Okay. And I, but mine, mine is still kind of brown right now, but it, but it begin to come out now. Once your grass start coming out of dormancy, and you start seeing some green there, that'd be a good time to start fertilizing your lawn then. Okay. And, and what I would use is probably something that, for my first uh, for application, I probably use some ammonia nitrate. Ammonia nitrate. Ammonia, okay. Yeah, try to get it started real good and start getting it, green it up. And but when Put ammonia nitrate down there, you need to make sure that you start, you water that in. Okay. If not, then it's can burn your lawn grass. Uh, then you might start then with 6, 12, 12, triple 13, at least by three times during the summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. That'd be a good time to do that. And then they can get that grass start growing and then start cutting. And also you can leave those clipping on the grass All right, as you right. do that. And that also add a little nutrient to the soil too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's called recycling. Recycling. Nutrient recycling. Recycling, recycling. That's, that's very good, yeah. All right. I Ammoni do that. Ammonia nitrate, though. That's yeah, going to make that grass grow. Maybe, maybe grow, but a ton of green. And okay. nitrate don't do two things now. Okay. Make it grow in a ton of green. That's why you need to water it in. Once you put it down, if not, it can burn your grass up. Yeah, it sure will. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, when should we add lime to our lines? One thing about lime, now lime normally stays in the soil for about three years. Once you get your soil pitched where you want it, it normally stays there for about three years. Okay. And the only way you can tell you need to add lime to it through a soil test, for most lawn grasses, you want it between 6.0 and 6.5. All right. And you do that through a soil test. And we do have a soil box okay. at our office. They can come out and do it and pick up a box and do a soil test in there. Okay. And it'll tell, about a week time, they'll get the results back. It'll tell them what they need to add to their soil, how much lime to add mm -hmm. when you put it down. And stuff in there, okay. but you put you put it down in the town more when you need it. Okay. But it's only it takes some time for it to get activated into the soil. Okay, and stuff in there. But for about every three years, once you get it at that six point one, six point five, it should stay there. It should stay there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Get your soil tested. And they also have soil boxes in Fayette County yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how often should we water our lawns during the summer months? And you know that's an important that's question. important thing. <laughs> it, 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 that just keep that grass looking good yeah. and everything. Now, how often is really a good question? How you do that? But one of the things we see a lot of people doing is going out there watering their grass by one or two minutes. <laughs> and then yeah. and then and then not good for your lawn. Right. Uh, not good for the roots of smarter grass. Mm -hmm. uh, we mostly have clay soil here, but if you do have sanding soil here, you might just check the grass, just make sure it's completely dry before you water it in there. But about an inch of water a week will most lawn sweet. need in here, about an inch of water a week. And early morning time is an ideal time to do that. No, you don't want to know. You go out there and put that sprinkling thing where you want it to go in, right. in, 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 <laughs> at night, early in the morning time when you get up like turn at 5 30. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go out there and cut it on there and, there and get about an inch of water to the soil then. Okay. Shadow water is really dangerous on your, on your grass. Now, sure. A lot of folks do that a lot of time. They, they go out there in a minute and they think you know when it's real hot. Those root systems start coming to the top of the ground yeah. and, and, and get killed by the, by the sun. Okay. So, Inch of water a week. Inch of water a week. Let it do it at one time. If it start running off, stop for a while and start back. 
Okay, mm -hmm. none of that one or two minutes. Not in one or two minutes. <laughs> All right, what's a good mowing height for our warm and cool season grasses? That's, that's, uh, yeah. We don't want to scalp the, uh, our lawn. No, so. we don't want to scalp it. Now, right. now, especially when it's real hot, mm -hmm. you know, you want to keep that grass at a certain height. And for Bermuda grass, between two and two and a half inches tall. Okay. And that's when it's actually growing. And when it gets real hot, I want to go to the highest level, okay. about two and a half inches tall, to make sure I'm protecting the root system from, that, from that, that weather, from that hot weather. No, they do get hot here now. Oh, yes, it, it do does. get hot. Yes, it does. And your fescue grass now, it, it's a cool season grass, but in the summertime, it stops kind of growing a lot. You know, it kind of slows down, like in July and mm -hmm. August and all that, because it's real hot. You want it somewhere between three inches tall at okay. summertime, but leave about three inches tall in the summertime, because most of the time your fescue grass is under tree. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the trees are getting a lot of the, the trees are getting a lot of the nutrient from the, the grass, and the fescue grass might need a little more water because they keep it going. It's not doing a whole lot of growing during the summertime, okay. but about three about three inches tall for your fescue, and about two and a half inches for your Bermuda grass. And that, that's a be good height there and stuff in there. Okay, because your, your cool season grasses want to go dormant during the summertime. They want to go dormant. Yeah, they are cool season grass. Cool season grass. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got shade trees or something. You might want to put some fescue or some down on those trees and stuff. That'd be really good. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, here's our next one. So how often should we sharpen? Our more blades during the summer. Now, I recommend at least at least, at least twice, especially doing a lot of cutting. Like I cut my grass, I cut mine like twice a week, you know. And I, oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I know you cut you in the same week. You know? <laughs> no, I don't. I cut at least twice a week in there and everything. But uh, you can a mow blade. You need to sharpen at least by at least by twice, at least by twice during the growing season. Okay. That's what I recommend, especially doing a lot of cutting your grass. And, and everything, you need to keep that blade sharp. If not, you can really tell the difference mm -hmm. in that grass. When you cut it, you got a dull blade. Mm -hmm. it, you just beating it down, and then you'll see the edges start turning brown mm -hmm. on the top real good. You know, I take my blade off, and I'm using my moody plus block plug. I don't want to be up in there messing around with some tongue and then things start up, but, yeah. <laughs> I, but, I, but I make sure that I undo that, and I take it off and take it to the store and get it sharp. And at least do that twice uh, during the growing season. And to make sure that I get that really good cut. And, cut you, and another thing, when you're cutting your grass, if you can't cut it different direction. Different direction. Yeah, yeah, do it. Stand that. it up. Stand it up. Yeah, don't cut the same way all the time. All right, thanks, Booger. We appreciate that information. Thank you. Twice a week. <laughs> Twice a week. <laughs> up next, Master Gardener Tom Mashore is out in the family plot garden to get us started with our warm season vegetables. We're going to plant some tomatoes and peppers today. Now this is a cherry tomato. We're going to put that here on the stake. And it's an indeterminate. Now, there's a, tomatoes are broken down in two major groups, determinants and indeterminates. Determinants grow to a determined size, usually four and a half to five feet and no higher. Indeterminates means there is no limit to how fast they grow depending on the season, temperature, weather, and so forth. So they usually are staked. You can use cages, but uh, they work well with stakes. I like to take them out of the pea pots. They just seem to do better for me that way. You always want to pre-moisten your plants before you plant them, usually for a couple hours before you put them in. That way they're well hydrated and it's less of a shock to them than putting them in the ground. It's got good root structure. So that's good. Now I'm going to plant this one pretty much in the same depth that it was in the container. And then backfill it. And when you dig your hole, make sure you make the hole a little bit bigger than the size of the plant so the plant has an easier time for the roots to spread out. Now because we're going to water it, Now, because it is an indeterminate, this post is only going to be about five foot above the ground. Now, we live in the Mid-South. In the Mid-South, we got about seven, seven and a half months of growing. So what's going to happen by the 1st of June, it's going to be the top of this post. What do you do? We've still got three or four months of growing. Well, what I did was made this extension. I drilled, took a PVC pipe. The outside diameter of the steep post is one and, a half, one and a quarter inches. The inside diameter of this is one and a quarter inches. I drilled holes along the side. I put a bolt down near the bottom. And the bolt keeps it from sliding down. You slip it on there like this.
course, I had to pick a T post. It's got a little burrower to it. There we go. You notice it fits on snugly. Then as it grows up, I can just tie it to these little loops, keep it from sliding down. This is a cherry tomato in every garden. If you got the space, you'd have just one cherry tomato plant because they're going to be the first to produce. So you're going to start getting fresh tomatoes, though they're cherry tomatoes, uh, until the main crop comes in. But don't forget those cherry tomatoes when you start harvesting the main crop. Otherwise, you're going to have grunches of cherry tomatoes all over the place the following season. They're going to do some peppers now. A little interesting fact here is that uh, I got some leaf lettuce here that went to seed last year and it uh, came back and it seems to be doing okay so we're just going to leave it in there and see what happens. We got the space, why not? You probably notice that I'm peeling off the pea pots which I prefer doing. Makes it easier for the roots to spread. And start back filling it. Now these plants are very bushy, so I'm planting them pretty much at the same depth they were in the pot. Again, you want to water around the plant, not just, just the plant itself. Encourage root development. With the tomatoes, we put the stake in first, then the tomatoes. If you're using a stake, but if you're going to use cages, you want to put the plant first in, and then put the cage around it. it makes it much easier to plant. Now this type of cage works well with peppers, but not so good with tomato plants. Right now we're going to plant some sweet, uh, sweet bell peppers. And we want to keep our peppers, sweet peppers and hot peppers, separated, like the uh, other members of the nightshade family, which is tomatoes, uh, potatoes, and eggplant. They're wind pollinated. And when you have hot peppers right near your sweet peppers, the chances you might end up with hot bell peppers from cross pollination. So in my garden, my uh, sweet peppers and my hot peppers are on two ends of the garden just to prevent that uh, cross-pollination. And the process is still the same. Dig your hole, or as my grandson would say, bury the plant. And otherwise, I also uh, peeled off the uh, peak pot. Now, there are some bottom leaves here that were the original leaves. I'm pitching them off, so hopefully they'll develop uh, additional roots around the leaf node where the leaf was. and we're gonna cage that also. Oh, look at this, we got a little critter here, which is a grub. Grubs are not good in the garden, get rid of it. I'm too, a little bit too icky to squeeze it. And a drink of water. Again, around the circumference. Put my marker in so I can remember what kind of a pepper it is. And again, they're pretty in flower beds. Hope you enjoy uh, working in the gardens, very fruitful, and enjoy that fresh produce. All right, thanks, Tom, for that wonderful information. Tanya, container gardening. Yeah. Why do we need to do this? Well, you know, not everybody has a nice large yard. Some people only have a patio, so it's great for people who don't have a lot of green space uh, okay. to be able to grow things. And um, also people who have... Um, I guess limited mobility issues, maybe they can't bend and stoop and, and weed like they used to. Container gardening <laughs> is a good solution for that. Yeah. Also, container gardening is very versatile. You can grow anything in, in a container. Um, everything from your single tomato plant to mm -hmm. you know a maple tree, think of bonsai. So um, anything that you wanna grow, you can put it in a pot. Put it in a pot. Yes, people have been growing uh, container gardening, um, doing container gardening for centuries. Think about the hanging gardens of Babylon. Yeah. So yeah. Um, container gardening is not new, but um, very useful. Okay. 
What should we think about when we're choosing a container? And I understand this is very important, so can you yes. explain that to us? Yes, the first thing I want to think about if I'm choosing a container is the size of my container. Right. So you want to match the size with what type of plant you're growing. So we have some different containers uh, here on the table. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the, the depth of the container is going to be deep enough for whatever you're trying to plant. For instance, you know, you're not going to plant a pepper plant in something <laughs> like this, right. you know. Yeah. Right. Now, however, if you had um, a larger container, like maybe say something this size, you know, you, you could plant a single vegetable in here. You'd have to choose carefully, maybe not a tomato, but you could do a pepper, an eggplant, something like okay. that. So the size and also, um, you want to think about the look of the container. Mm -hmm. What kind of a look are you going for? So if you're just going to plant a tomato plant, it's going to be out in the back near the vegetable. You know, you want to have a little vegetable area. Yeah. People aren't going to see it. You know, a five gallon bucket will work. But if it's going to be something right next to your patio, you want to think about, you know, do I want an elegant look? Yeah. Do I want a rustic <laughs> look? You know, kind of a quirky, brightly colored kind of a pot. Yeah. Um, what kind of look and feel do you want? So. Um, also, another thing to look for is drainage holes, like this particular container doesn't have a drainage hole, so you would want to be careful about what you're going to put in that. I would, I use containers without drainage holes in my house for my interior plants. Oh, okay. I just take the grow pot the, that the indoor plant comes in, I just leave it in that grow pot and just plop it right into something like this that's decorative. Mm. You don't have to repot it cover it up the top with some moss or something to make it look pretty. That's all you have to do. But if you're going to plant something that's going to go outside and you're going to be watering it, it's got to have a drainage yeah, hole. Got to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then what about potting soil? Is there a special kind of potting soil we need to use? In general, no. I mean, okay. that doesn't no. always hold true unless you're doing orchids or something. But most of your plants just like a, a nice, good quality potting soil that you can buy at any store. Um, and if you have a very, very large container that you want to plant um, and you're worried about the, the expense, yeah. and not only the expense, but just the weight of it, um, you can fill the bottom of those really large containers with something like plastic water bottles or milk jugs, anything to kind of take up space in there and put a layer of, uh, just a layer of uh, landscape fabric across the top of that and then put your soil on top and that way that landscape fabric will keep the soil from getting down into whatever you use to take okay. up space down there. Just make sure you've left enough room at the top for the roots to grow. Okay. And it is going to be heavy enough so it's not going to blow your pot over. But of course if you have a nice heavy ceramic pot you don't really have to worry about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And quickly, how do we know if it's good soil or not? I, I, I just tend to go and buy, you know, something at the store, you okay. know, like okay. a potting mix. You don't really want to use your garden soil. Um, that's not that's not good for okay. container gardening. Um, and you can, people have asked me before, can I reuse the, the potting soil that I bought last oh, year? Um, you can usually get by with a second year out of that. Okay. You might want to take it out and mix it with some fresh to kind of prolong it. Eventually it's going to be not good anymore mm -hmm. and you're going to need to start fresh, but you can get by on a year or two using that same soil. Okay, good. Now, how about this question? Okay. Watering. Okay, yeah. um, watering. Now, things in containers do sometimes dry out a little bit faster. Yes. Yes. So you have to watch them a little bit more carefully, especially clay pots that are kind of porous tend to dry out a little faster, I think. Um, I try to use the finger test. You know, stick your finger okay. in the soil up to your second knuckle, and if it feels wet, you know, you don't have to worry about it. Sometimes you can just tell by looking at the top of the soil. Um, whether or not it's too dry. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've all seen, it's happened at my house, you let the pot get so dry, the soil starts to pull away yeah. from the sides of uh -huh. the pot. Now, if that happens, you need to really thoroughly water that, that pot. So one thing, if you have a small uh, container, what you can do is just get like a, a large bucket, something larger, fill it with water and just set your container down into that and let it soak up from the bottom through okay. the drainage holes. Um, if it's too large to do that, you want to use your hose or whatever, water it thoroughly, wait a little while, water it thoroughly again, because if you don't, it'll just go right down the sides right. between the drawed up soil and your, the sides of your container, so that's not good. Hey, that's a good tip because nothing kills more plants than over water. Over water, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Tanya. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you.
time for Q&A, and Tom Ashore has joined us. Okay, here's our first question. And it is a letter from Lois up in Henning, Tennessee. And she has two questions. The first one, how do you get rid of wild onions on your lawn? Guess, guess what I have here? A wild, wild onion. onion. All right. <laughs> but it's wild garlic. Oh, right, garlic, okay. It's more wild garlic in Tennessee than wild onion. Oh. Here's mm -hmm. the difference. The leaves of the wild onion are flat and not hollow. Wild garlic, hollow mm -hmm. okay. Okay. and not flat. So you have wild garlic. You see the little bulbs at the bottom, okay? Mm -hmm. Food reserves. Okay. These are winter perennials, mm -hmm. okay? Winter perennials, okay. all right? So germinate in the fall, grow during the fall, throughout the winter, and actually produce bublets in the spring, in the early spring. So if you want to get rid of them, there's a couple of things you could do. The first one is this. If you have a trial and you don't have too many of them, you can dig it out. If you have a nice <laughs> moist soil, you know, just dig it out, make sure you get all the bublets. Or if you must use a chemical, this is what you can use. Uh, you can use any chemical that's a three-way. And what I mean by three-way, it contains three active ingredients that will control broadleaf weeds. An example of that is Weed Be Gone Max, okay? Or there's another product that you can use and it's called Image. Image does a real good job in controlling wild garlic. But I said it's a winter perennial. So you need to control it either in the fall or early spring, okay? If you don't do it then, you can mow it, <laughs> but mow it only makes it weak. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a bulbs, so it'll still be there and it's gonna last maybe for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So timing is critical in controlling your wild garlic. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. and here's her second question. How and when do you plant garlic. What do you think about that, Mr. Tom? Well, I let nature tell me. Okay. <laughs> Nature's going to tell us. When you start seeing the wild garlic uh -huh. and wild onion appearing in the garden, nature is telling it's time for it. Okay. So that's what I use. And generally speaking, it's usually about the first part of November. But uh, now I know all our gardeners don't have wild onions and garlic, so you have to look at your neighbor's <laughs> pond. Mm -hmm. But when you see it, it's time to get that garlic in. Okay. All right. Mm. Here's our next question. And this is a viewer email from Roger, all right? Mm -hmm. He writes, how critical is planting tomatoes in the same place as last year? Who, who wants to get that one? Well, one of the things uh, I, 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 like, okay. I like to uh, rotate my vegetable in my garden, okay. because a lot of times the disease getting this on tomato plant, it might not attack something else you put there. But you know what, in the same family, though, when you start rotating your vegetable, you don't want to put uh, you don't want to go in and put no pepper there. Okay. But they get the same kind of disease or something that a, that a tomato get. Right. But they're like the, the same family. Same family, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I like to try to rotate, man, you know, come back to the same place about every three years. Mm -hmm. They might get that disease, uh, insect time to move on to something to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in there. So that's, that's how I do that. Like, it. It's very critical in rotating your vegetables. Yeah. So you should rotate your vegetables. Anybody else would like to add anything? Well, I like the uh, uh, quadrant method. Okay. You divide your garden into quarters. Mm -hmm. And then when you had in quarter number one, gets moved to quarter number two. When you had in quarter number four, gets moved into quarter number one. So you're on a four year rotation. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much covers pretty good just by dividing, like I said, the garden, however you want to do it, north, south, east, west, doesn't really matter. Just divide it in fours. And each time you plant one quarter, the next season you move it over a quarter. Good. Yeah. Makes good sense too. Yeah. Tony, you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, a lot of your tomato diseases, you know, some of them are soil born. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if you get one of those soil born tomato diseases, there is nothing we can tell you to do but pull them out of the ground. Yeah. That's why it's so important that you rotate your crop and after it's in that soil, it's pretty hard to get rid of. Right, and, and those would be like your wilts and your blights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're exactly right. right yeah. Hi, Mr. Roger, there you have it. Please rotate. Uh, here's our last question. It's also about tomatoes. Oh. Mm -hmm. When do you fertilize tomatoes? Who wants to shout at that one? Well, I Tell like to fertilize them uh, about every two weeks with a light amount of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Not like real heavy. And also going along with that, when you water, you don't want to water just the tomato plant. You want to water all the way around the tomato plant out to the drip line mm -hmm. and keep it moist. Mm -hmm. You don't want it wet and dry periods. You want to keep it evenly moist. It doesn't have to be flooded, just keep it moist, and that will encourage the roots to spread, making for a stronger plant. Yeah, and one of the things, again, that you don't want to hold, you fertilize, but you want to use something to kind of lower nitrogen. 
Once mm -hmm. they start putting on fruit, because you know, you can have a pretty tall plant <laughs> and have no tomatoes on there. Right. And what they have, you don't fed too much nitrogen fertilizer, and they don't like a whole lot of nitrogen fertilizer. I wouldn't give them a whole lot of nitrogen fertilizer until they start putting on a little tomatoes, seeing tomatoes still, still kind of hold back on it some, but they like need more like phosphorus and potassium somewhere there, because they got fruits on there, and you want it more and that in there. But hold back on your nitrogen fertilizer. We, don't get, we get that call all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I have a pretty plant. And no tomatoes on there, and what's the problem? We know they don't gave it too many fertilizer in there, too many nitrogen fertilizer, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nitrogen six, fertilizer. six, twelve, twelve works yeah. good for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's Tell also good for sweet peppers. All right. Thank you all for that. That was good. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.